Welcome to Books in Action. My name is Melissa Kopecki. I'm the director of the South Orange Public Library, where I have the pleasure of dealing in books occasionally as part of my professional life. But it's an extra pleasure to be able to come and talk about books with authors and people who love them. And tonight we're very privileged to have as a guest Richard Lutz, who wrote the book. I keep wanting to call it Yadviga's Crossing, but I guess it's really Jadviga's no, Crossing. No, it's actually Yadviga's. The no. Jews, the James <laughs> pronounced like a Y. Okay, um, so there, I... there are a number of little conflicts like that in Polish, of course, with names and with other words as well. But in this case, it's Jadwiga's Crossing. Okay, so um, I, it's just truly a wonderful book. I, I was initially intrigued sort of by the story behind the story before I even started reading it, and that is there you are a co-author, and do you want to tell us who the, the other co-author is? It's my dad, actually. Uh, dad started this, uh, uh, started this story back in the 1950s believe it or not, about the time that he got bored with most of what was on television. And he would retire to his study and scribble in the leftover notebooks from my classes in grade school. Uh, he would you know, take those empty pages and fill them with uh, ideas, uh, sketches that would ultimately become part of this book. Unfortunately, Dad died in uh, 1966. Uh, without having finished the book, and in fact, uh, uh, primarily having produced that number of sketches that would ultimately be incorporated into the book. And for a number of years, it traveled with me wherever I went, and uh, from time to time I would get it out and do a little editing. Um, he had actually uh, taught me to type in order that I could be his typist on this project uh, originally, but uh, in fact, uh, what ended up happening is that I took the material that he had created and uh, tied it together, added a great deal, because the story was incomplete, and that was the result. So it's a collaboration over a half a century uh, between uh, a deceased father and a son who um, you know, was 20-something when he died, and uh, nonetheless carried that along to, uh, to finish up one day. Well, to divert for a second, I mean, you were singularly placed to be able to, to do that for your father because your career has involved words and getting things done. And can you tell us just a little bit about what yeah, you Yeah, my, my, my career has been one of a journalist and uh, largely in public broadcasting, um, largely in Pennsylvania uh, at a couple of stations there, but also in Wisconsin and in Chicago and a couple of other places along the way. Um, so, yes, a, a writer in, in, in television. Um, I've also uh, been publisher of a magazine at one point uh, uh, and, and have written for newspapers as well. So, yeah, a lot of words. And I think I became a writer, really, because uh, Dad, having taught me to type, uh, words were a natural uh, out, outflow from being able to type. And, and uh, I used to enjoy, among other things, copying... Um, uh, articles out of the newspaper uh, by typing them. So I, I think that might have given me a sort of handle on how news stories should be structured. It was, it was one of those things that a father implants in his son and you can't lose it. <laughs> it right. goes on and on. And at the time you kind of probably denied that it's happening, but look at how, how lovely it is that this has sort of come full circle. For, well, for I, both I, of I feel as though I'm paying him back in a sense by, fin <laughs> by finishing his book. Um, as a matter of fact, I did a reading back in our hometown. The story ends in our hometown. And I did a reading back there and uh, about 35 relatives showed up, about half of whom I didn't even know I had. <laughs> so oh, that's a it, wonderful it was, it was a thing. Of, and, they were, and they were, you know, enchanted by the fact that Dad had taken these stories that they too had heard as youngsters growing up uh, in the Polish neighborhood and had begun to build them into a story uh, as a kind of completed whole. The, the stories are disconnected when you hear them over kitchen tables and and so on um, uh, when you're growing up as a youngster. But then to take those and to pull them together in a way that it would make a continuous story or a, a storyline that would work was, uh, was essentially what he did and what I, I helped with uh, following on uh, uh, some 30 or 40 years later. Yeah. 
And I think we didn't say, but the, the ending of the story is in Dunkirk in New York State on yes. the edge of Lake Erie. Indeed. And it's basically a story of, of Polish immigration. And, and when you get into the story, there's a lot of very powerful characters. So, of course, knowing a little bit about the history of it, I was like, oh, you know, are these relatives? Are these, you know, actual, did these people actually, you know, interact in the ways they do in the story? Which I guess it's probably a little of both. It's a little of both. You know, it's very hard to pin down because um, when Dad died, um, he had uh, created much of this from what he had heard as a child, as a young man growing up. Um, and it's hard to know which, sto which stories came from family, and which stories came from neighbors, and which stories were created out of whole cloth. Um, I created a few myself, so I know that that part is fiction, for sure. But they were pieces that would t tie together other pieces uh, in the story, and in some sense, it reads like 50 short stories uh, or 50 incidents put together over a period of time. It's, in a sense, a little bit like a soap opera, I suppose, in the sense that you read a chapter and you want to go on to the next one because, gosh, how does this come out? You know? Right. Most definitely. And it's definitely full of, of action. I mean, it, it starts in Poland and you do an absolutely magnificent job of, of giving a feel. Um, yeah. My family, I have no Polish roots, but I have Czechoslovakian roots, which are very, very close. And it, it gave a feeling of going back a, more than a century and, and what, what life was like. And it's interesting because your two main characters who end up getting married are really having very different Polish experiences. They're from different cultures, different parts of Poland, with different attitudes entirely. Jadwiga, who is the heroine, and really the centerpiece of the story, Jadwiga is from the Baltic coast. And, and, and as it happens, on the Baltic coast in those days, and I think it may be true to a certain extent, the women ran the families. The men were almost incidental. And, uh, but in, in his part of Poland, the men were in charge. So there's a built-in conflict there. But of course, there's also the conflict that Paul is uh, a soldier. He's been serving uh, required time in Bismarck's army. The year is 1869. He's been serving required time um, as a draftee, um, carrying a shovel, not a, not a, not a rifle. And uh, uh, he has become somewhat, somewhat, Germani Germanified by uh, Bismarck's uh, Kulturkampf, as it was called, culture war. And uh, uh, so he uh, brings that to this story, and he feels that not everything German is bad, whereas Jadwiga and her father, Edmund, feel you know very upset and unhappy and terribly put upon by the fact that the Germans occupy Poland. This is at a time when Poland was divided among Austria, Russia, and Germany. And there was essentially no Poland. And Poland was kept alive as a concept and as a culture by the people stubbornly resisting this Germanification. Yeah. But some people in the Polish communities took this on almost without choice. Uh, the Polish language was banned at one point. It could not be used. Uh, but still, people maintained their connection with their language and their culture and their, their literature, uh, their music. And uh, they did this uh, over a long period of time, as you know, uh, uh, in spite of being occupied and being made, to, made into a non-country, uh, essentially. Uh, so there's this conflict of feeling very Polish and yet being pulled by the forces that were pulling po Poland apart at the time. And I've got to say, I guess it's partly coming out of this tradition of storytelling and, and how sort of the, the characters develop that way in the real world. It's not like you're reading about this historically. You're thrown back in the time, which is what the best of historical fiction does. And you feel those tensions because of what's happening to the characters, or because of the conversations they're having, or the mindset you see them approaching a new circumstance with. 
but particularly in the story of emigration, it's it's really interesting because it sort of foreshadows what's going to happen. Well, it certainly happens on the ship, and that is the bulk of the book. You know, the the uh, collision of yes. cultures and and personalities in a very small space under very hard conditions. Yeah. But also, what happens to communities that form in the United States, sort of side by side with people who are already there and bringing mm -hmm. old traditions, but to a new land yeah. with new ideas. You know, one of the things that happens to us, I think, is we, if we look in history books or we look at old pictures of family members, we tend to think of them as living in a black and white world, and you think of them as standing around very stiffly having their picture taken. But in fact, these were vibrant, alive, exciting people. They fell in love, they had arguments, they believed things, and they believed things against what somebody they loved believed, which was the opposite. Uh, they fought over things. They had uh, arguments and battles among themselves. They were real, living, breathing people. And the idea here is to, to, to bring that out, to show that, in fact, they weren't just stiffs standing to have a portrait taken uh, by somebody who was, uh, had a black and white film camera that was you know, taking a picture of them. Uh, they, they really were exciting people. They took chances. They took a chance to come to America. They believed that they had what it would take to come to a new country, to take on challenges that they wouldn't face if they had stayed back home in Poland. But they believed in themselves, and they believed that they could make it, and that made them exciting people and in some sense, they're the people who, as entrepreneurs and as cultural pioneers, made the, the beginnings of America in its first hundred years work as a country. Um, I've got to say, as part of that whole process, I'd never really thought about how much of that process gels on the ship. So maybe that's something we could talk about that is the bulk of, of um, of the, the story is what's actually happening as they're sailing on a pretty miserable ship in pretty miserable conditions. So um, we are going to need to take a break for a minute. So um, we will do that and we will come back and we'll hear a little bit of the story when we come back too, which will be a lovely thing. After 17 years working as a mason, Mike was laid off. I met him when he came into the library looking for help. He found a job opening, but the application was only online. Mike said he'd spent his entire life around tools, but had never used a computer. I showed him how, and he ended up applying for numerous jobs online. I saw Mike the other day. His new computer skills paid off. He's working again. New Jersey libraries are transforming lives. Tell us your story. Books in Action. I'm Melissa Kopecki, and our guest is Richard Lutz, and we are talking about the book Jadwiga's Crossing, and it's just a, a, just a great book. We've been having a great conversation. I hope you've been enjoying it. We're going to jump right in here with um, a reading from the book because we are lucky enough to have somebody who can do justice to the words that he's written, which is not always the case. So <laughs> I'll do I'll do a little setup here, uh, Melissa. The um, the, the two lovers in this story are Jadwiga and uh, her young husband Paul. They've been married less than uh, less than a year at this point, but uh, Jadwiga is pregnant. Uh, they're traveling across uh, Poland toward Bremerhaven, Germany, aboard a flat car with a contingent of other uh, Polish people who are emigrating to the United States, to America, as they call it. And um, Paul. Uh, has made a bit of a fool of himself. He's the youngest of the group, uh, other than Jadwiga, and he has uh, tried to use his knowledge of German, which he learned in the army, to get some things done unsuccessfully. And he's made the mistake, incidentally, of wearing his uniform uh, from his mustering out. And as a result of that, everybody sort of right away dislikes him. 
but uh, that's, that's the setup. Now, they reach a point where they need water. The children are very thirsty, the women are very thirsty. The men go running to get water for um, uh, when the train stops. And they run into a train yard, and Paul reads a sign. He realizes they're taking water that comes directly from the river and is intended for locomotives. And he says, we can't eat, can't eat this, we can't drink this water. Uh, and they, they send one of the young boys to stop the men who have already gone back to the flat car with, the, with, the, um, with this bad water. And so now uh, the problem is to find real water. So he asks a trainman, where do we go for good water? And he points them to a, uh, to a well. And uh, so they're standing at the well, and they're uh, beginning to pump water. They pump some for the trainmen. And then the, uh, uh, they, they are about to start pumping for themselves. And uh, incidentally, the day before all this happens, Paul has had a fight with the biggest man in the bunch, a man named Big Joseph. OK, so here we go. But just as jo uh, Joseph took up a pail to fill it, a group of workers came from the freight house, five of them, one in the lead. Each one carried a metal tool. The leader waved a hand at the emigrants to warn them away from the pump. In German, he shouted at them all. Only Paul understood his words, but they all knew what the man meant. No water for train passengers, he said. Payment first. He was a big man, the muscles of years of lifting showing under his jacket. Pay first, he said, looking to see if anyone understood him. The Poles backed away. They had no choice. They had no tools to use as weapons, and the workers were crowding them. They want money for water? They want our money, Stanislaw asked. The big German took the crank handle from the pump and held it in crossed arms, saying something to the effect that if these Polak water seekers had the money to travel to America, they must also have money for water. Paul understood him, but he did not answer immediately. He searched his memory for German words. As he did, the funster, Jan Poglicki, suggested that by himself, Big Josef could probably beat the entire crew of the warehouse, let alone just these five. Big Josef was ready. We'll just take the water, Jan said, and bash them if they try to stop us. Wait, Paul said. First, let Lansik run to get the other men while I talk with this one. Stanislaw said to his son, go, hurry. Good morning, mein Herr, Paul said. The man's eyes, which had been darting among the group of them, now fixed on Paul. There was clearly some surprise at his crisp military German. But the man made no reply. Do I understand correctly, Paul asked, choosing his German words carefully, that you wish to collect money for this water? Yes, the man said, as Paul approached him. You will be forgiving of me, please, if I speak your language poorly. His mind raced. He had no idea what to say to get the man to give the water without paying, much less how to say it in German. He could only stall until Lansik brought the other men. Would you allow me, he said. He spoke hesitantly and with great deference lowering his voice, to speak with you over here. He gestured to indicate a place away from the two opposing groups of men. Shrugging, amused, the man walked the few steps with Paul. Allow me to explain something of our circumstances, Paul began. He was imitating a phrase he had practiced after hearing Lieutenant Schubert use it many times, although almost always sarcastically. This helped him fall into the rhythm of the German language, but he still groped for the words he needed. These men and their wives, und der Kindern, have all been aboard a train without water for over a day. There is a great need for water. Then there is a great need to pay, the man said loudly, glancing back at his fellow workers. Verstehe, Paul said. Let me find the words, you wish money, the pump belongs to the shipping company for which I work, not to the railroad. Those from the train must pay. Yes, you want money. Uh, excuse my request, but would you be so kind as to look at the papers I carry? Stiffly, with exaggerated ceremony, taking as much time as he could, he reached for his discharge papers. Deliberately, he went to the wrong pocket, then to the right one. He took the papers from within the envelope 
and in an attitude of great deference and exaggerated care, he smoothed them against his uniform before handing them to the man. He even clicked his heels. For a fleeting moment, he allowed himself to hope that the man could not read. But after a moment, the man looked at him with a mean smile beginning to creep across his mouth. Why, these papers are nothing more than... Yeah, Paul said. Yeah, true. They are simply discharge papers from your army. That's all they are. It's true. But the others, your comrades, they don't know that. I would only suggest, begging your pardon, that a good ending of this question of water for thirsty women and children is might be that you tell your friends that it is a German army matter, that I carry an official paper. I suggest this only because I can see only one other possible ending to this disagreement, which would involve fighting. He was surprising himself. He had never before spoken so many German words at one time without resting. I don't believe these men will allow me to pay you for water, but they will not go back to their children without water. The man stiffened and began to uncross his arms, tightening his grip on the pump handle and drawing himself up threateningly. Deferentially, Paul held up a hand, asking for a moment longer to reason with him. It would be well, you see, to end this without fighting. Just yesterday, I myself fought the big one over there, and I can tell you it took all the others, nine or ten men, to keep him from crippling me. He is the one you personally will have to fight. Now from the corner of his eye, he saw the other men coming at a run. And if you will look to the place I look, you will see that we will not be fighting alone. Without moving his head, he showed with his eyes where he wanted the man to look. When he looked back, the man was not so stiff. Now, mein Herr, I extend my hand, hoping you will take it in friendship, and tell your men they must not stop fathers who need water for children. It is an army matter. Say that to them. But if you don't take my hand in friendship, try instead to hit me with that pump crank, and the fighting can begin with us. And the big Polak over there will make you a cripple. Those from the warehouse were now outnumbered. Even with the tools, the odds were against them. Glaring, the man shook Paul's hand, saying nothing. Then Paul stepped back, clicked his heels, and saluted. He then reached out for the pump handle, which the man let him take. To his gang from the warehouse, the German spoke sharply, too quickly for Paul to understand every word, except that he heard army and army paper and army matter and permission. The men backed away. Paul stepped up to the pump, inserted the crank handle, and with a grand gesture, invited Big Joseph to turn it. What did you say? Stanislaw asked. Merely that Big Joseph would kill him, Paul responded. So this is the way that Paul Adamic becomes accepted in this contingent of travelers who are about to, about to board a ship in Bremerhaven uh, for a very difficult trip across the Atlantic to New York. Well, the, another interesting part that that illustrates is how much of the journey and how arduous it was before they ever even got on the ship. Yes. You know, just, just crossing and how full of difficulties and conflict that was and, and you know, yeah. the... Uh, At the time, the, the German entrepreneurs were making money, taking condemned ships out of retirement to take care of the emigration trade. They were putting people on flat cars and moving them across Poland and into Germany to Bremerhaven, putting them on wagons. They were treated like cattle and, in fact, aboard the Frederica, which is the ship. They lived with the pigs and, uh, and with cattle and horses. Uh, they were, they were uh, literally stored in the hold of the ship. I think that whole story is reflected very much in, in some of the stories you hear about people now desperate to get to the United States or somewhere else, and, and that there's always people willing to take advantage of them and take money from them and put them in, in, in human conditions. Um, 
But while you were reading, we were having the, the pleasure of looking at this beautiful painting, and I really did want to ask you a little bit about it. It um, was not created for this story, but it brings the story to life so very well. Um, can you tell me a little bit about finding that? This was painted uh, during the time uh, the, of the story. And in fact, the, the uh, painter uh, lived from 1858 to 1908. His name was Charles Friedrich Ulrich. And the name, this is called In the Land of Promise, Castle Garden. And in fact, here you see uh, a, a, a sign that was put up in multiple languages so that um, the, uh, the emigrants who were arriving at Castle Garden, which is prior to Ellis Island as the arrival point for uh, people coming to America, they would read this and know the rules. And this, in fact, was painted at Castle Garden. I've been there. You can go, go there now um, at, the, um, at the Battery, uh, down at the tip of Manhattan. And uh, uh, these people are waiting to be processed. And uh, this is, of course, Jadvika yes, with her new face baby. Yes, this is just absolutely beautiful. And the idea of not only taking that trip, but being pregnant and, and having children during the process is amazing. So. She may have grown up where Polish women were sort of, um, I, I think once they get to the United States, you see that again, that the women were the ones who really, really were able to pull things off. Um, we didn't have a chance to talk about the newspaper that you um, are the editor of now, the Main Street Wire. That's why we had these set for Roosevelt Island in New York. Um, and we didn't have a chance to talk about the fact that you are planning to write a sequel. Yes, there's a sequel in the works, Yad Vigas America. Folks who read it are saying, when do we get the read to read the rest of the story? So, <laughs> yes, indeed, there's a, uh, there's a sequel in the works. And if folks will go on to yadvigascrossing.com, they'll find the information they need to be able to be notified when the sequel is ready. But, of course, they want to read the first story first, the right. story of the crossing. But that's okay. We'll have you back to talk about the second part. <laughs> okay. Um, and yes, in the meantime, anybody who could read this, it's really appropriate for teenagers as well as uh, adults. Yeah, it's crafted carefully to be acceptable reading for everybody from junior high school age on up. And in fact, uh, there are a couple of circumstances where it has been assigned reading for young children to learn about the, immigra the immigration process. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank it you for having pleasure. me. It was a pleasure. We ran out of time too fast. All right. Thank you. <laughs>